That's tremendous. Tammy, how long have you been singing? Oh, boy. Long time? Well, since I was about 12, professional. <laughs> <laughs> See what you do. I'm sorry. Undoubtedly, one of the most talented and gifted voices this world has ever seen, the kind, beautiful and vivacious Tammy Terrell was something else. On top of this, her chemistry with duet partner the legendary Marvin Gaye was magical. Their voices were not only exquisite, but perfectly matched. Many say they were a match made in heaven. Away from this, her intelligence too was unrivaled. An honor student in high school who went on to get a pre-med scholarship at the University of Pennsylvania, she was definitely cut from a special cloth. And this is why her passing on at a mere age of 24 due to brain tumor sent shockwaves to every corner of the world as it was such a tragedy to lose such a special soul. It is in the public domain of how much of a tortured soul she was, the cruelty she faced throughout her life, and that a number of her fans have never quite moved on from her demise, a section of them believe that in some way God got tired of Tammy being misused and took her to a better place away from this cruel world. Regardless, we can only imagine what she could have turned out to be had she been given more time. Many assumptions have been made about her untimely death and her life in general with many rumors and hearsay going around, but this is her candid and untold story, a story that will help clear the doubts and give answers to the vague and undefined question marks. Tammy was born Thomasina Winifred Montgomery, on April 29, 1945, in a pretty tough neighborhood of Philadelphia as the eldest of the two daughters to Jenny and Thomas Montgomery. Jenny was an actress, and Thomas was a barbershop owner and local politician who was well respected. Tammy's birth was more than anticipated. They really looked forward to her birthday. Reason. Her parents really hoped she was going to be a boy for her to be named after her dad, but it was not meant to be. They decided to settle on Thomasina, the feminine name of Thomas, and nicknamed her Tommy. Right from birth, she was full of life and energy, the lively type, always going around entertaining anyone and everyone. The parents, impressed by this, enrolled her to piano and dancing lessons when she was only three. She also began singing in churches and school talent shows and developed a deeper liking to music, telling everyone how big of a star she would become. Her relationship with her mother, however, wasn't that great as she was always in and out of hospital due to depression and headaches. Fast forward, at age 11, what happened to her changed her character forever. One evening, on her way home, she was beaten up and molested sexually by three older boys. For a while, she became withdrawn, and her energetic personality vanished as she sought to stay behind closed doors. Reports say that even though she managed to identify the boys to the authorities, the case was in some way swept under the carpet. Being introduced to sex in such a way was in many ways brutal to her. Just a kid, by three older, stronger boys, in such a painful, forced and violent way, isn't a way for a girl to be introduced to such a sacred act. And considering it was still in the 50s, there were no therapy, supports or such for victims of abuse. Also, considering her mum was sick, she had to silently heal. And that's what she sadly did. They say the moment she resurfaced again, she was a totally different person, possessing the opposite of what people expected. People expected her to hate the men, she loved them more and was always around them. People expected her to be laid back, depressed and with low self-esteem. She was extroverted more than ever, vivacious and always full of life. She became promiscuous too. We managed to reach out to a couple of psychologists to get answers on why victims of abuse would result to promiscuity, something that ironically reminds them of their trauma every time they indulge, and what they told us in some way resonated with us. One, victims would become promiscuous because believe it or not, it serves as a defense mechanism for them. They feel if they behave this way, no one will bother them because they're in control by using their bodies. If you are controlling, then they can't hurt you. There's also the idea that you aren't worth anything besides for sex and that you're ready to offer it as you believe people view you as an object. Anyway, she was ready to face the world again. It is also during this time that she also began having severe headaches. 
which they brushed it off with the excuse that it ran in the family and was just a normal thing. She became super active in the talent shows and even managed to win a talent contest at Philadelphia's Earl Theatre while she was still 11. She also decided to change her name to Tammy, inspired by the theme song of the film Tammy and the Bachelor when she was 12, probably driven by the urge to disassociate with her former self. Four years later, after hard work and persistence, she was discovered by the legendary Luther Dixon and signed a deal with the one subsidiary of Scepter Records. She recorded the ballad If You See Bill under the name Tammy Montgomery and also worked on doing demos for the Shirelles. In 1962, she recorded a second single, The Voice of Experience, and left shortly after, after the godfather of soul, James Brown, saw her perform live and decided to give her a contract to sign as a backup singer for his review concert tours. This was one offer she was never going to turn down, considering how big of a name James Brown was, despite her parents' objections considering how young she was. What she didn't know was James Brown not only saw the talent, but also her beauty. Once they hit the road, he didn't waste time on her. He began showering her with numerous gifts just to lure her into liking him. In 1963, she recorded the song I Cried under Brown's Try Me Records, which became her first charting single, reaching number 99 on the Billboard Hot 100. Despite her music career looking promising, she was not happy, not happy because of what was happening behind curtains. She was in an abusive relationship with James Brown, who was known to be a very controlling man. Tammy decided enough was enough when Brown, after a live performance, hit her for not staying to watch him perform till the end. She left and never looked back. She then signed with Checker Records a year later, releasing If I Would Marry You, a duet with Jimmy Radcliffe, which didn't quite perform as she had expected, and this prompted her to announce she was retiring temporary to concentrate, to pursue her dream to be a doctor. She had the intelligence and the beauty and the talent to be anything she wanted to be. She was an honor student at Germantown High School and had managed to get a scholarship to attend the University of Pennsylvania as a pre-med student. Two years in, Jerry Butler convinced her to sing with him in a series of shows in nightclubs, assuring her that she'd continue with her schooling. In April 1965, while touring with Butler during a performance at the 20 Grand Club in Detroit, she was spotted by Motown CEO Berry Gordy, who promised to sign her to Motown. Tammy agreed and signed with the label on April 29, 1965, her 20th birthday. It is also in 1965 where she was briefly engaged to heavyweight boxer Ernie Terrell, the brother of Jean Terrell, a future member of the Motown supergroup, the Supremes, and even went ahead to assume his surname, Terrell, as it felt more convenient as a stage name. She made her label debut with the single I Can't Believe You Love Me, which became Terrell's first R&B Top 40 single, followed almost immediately by Come On and See Me. In 1966, Terrell recorded two future classics, Stevie Wonder's All I Do Is Think About You and the Eiley Brothers' This Old Heart of Mine Is Weak For You. All the follow-up singles never quite hit the airwaves. After the release of her first single on Motown, Terrell joined the Motortown Review opening for The Temptations. It is here that she embarked on a torrid romance with The Temptations lead singer David Ruffin in 1966, who at the time was at the top of the world with the group. It is said that at one point Ruffin even refused to travel with his fellow Temptations in a bus and opted to travel with Terrell in a limo. He always went in heavy in impressing her. She even accepted her surprise marriage proposal the same year, but shock to her, she learnt that Ruffin was married. He had a wife, three children, and another girlfriend in Detroit. Topped up with Ruffin's drug addiction and pride, it marked the start of numerous problems with the two always engaging in violent arguments. It is said that her headaches doubled during this time from the constant quarrels which really affected her emotional state. She decided to end the relationship in 1967 after Ruffin allegedly hit her on the head with a motorcycle helmet. 
Her luck finally came in 1967 when she was chosen to replace Kim Weston as Marvin Gaye's recording partner. Even though Gaye had previously recorded and found success with Mary Wells as well as Weston, he and Terrell found a chemistry that neither of them had experienced before. Tammy was very spirited when recording with Marvin. Marvin at the time was a laid-back, shy gentleman, while Terrell was a real ball of fire. Maybe it is because she finally found someone who let her dominate without the need of making her feel inferior like her past experiences with men. The duo broke into the top 20 pop chart in 1967 with Ain't No Mountain High Enough. The twosome string of hits continued with If I Could Build My Whole World Around You, Your Precious Love, which landed in the top five in 1967, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, and You're All I Need to Get By which topped the R&B charts in 1968. It was no doubt the Terrell Gay chemistry produced some of the most memorable love songs of the Motown era, and the aura of romance that the two created in their songs led to persistent rumours that they were lovers. The duo also performed together on television shows to their hits. They were voted the number one R&B duo in Cashbox magazine's annual year-end survey in 1970. Though the partnership was creatively and professionally successful, Terrell and Gay were doomed as a team from the start. After suffering from severe migraine headaches for some time, on October 14, 1967, while performing Your Precious Love with Gay at Hampton Sydney College, just outside the town of Farmville, Virginia, Terrell collapsed into Gay's arms on stage. Doctors first diagnosed exhaustion, but later discovered a brain tumour. She underwent her first surgery, and after recovering, she returned to Hitsville Studios in Detroit and recorded You're All I Need to Get By. Both that song and Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing reached number one on the R&B charts. Despite Terrell's optimism, her tumour worsened, requiring more surgeries which totaled seven. By 1969, Terrell had retired from live performances as she had been ordered by doctors not to perform due to her tumours. Motown issued Terrell's first and only solo album, Irresistible, in early 1969. Terrell was too ill to promote the recordings. There was no new repertoire on the album. All tracks had been recorded earlier and subsequently shelved for some time. Late in 1969, the optimistic Terrell made her final public appearance at the Apollo Theatre, where Marvin Gaye was performing. As soon as Gaye spotted Terrell, he rushed to her side, and the duo began singing, You're All I Need to Get By Together. They were given a standing ovation by the public. By early 1970, as the complications worsened, Terrell was confined to a wheelchair. She experienced blindness and hair loss, and weighed only 93 pounds. Following her eighth and final operation on January 21, 1970, Terrell went into a coma and never woke up. She died on March 16, a month before her 25th birthday. This sent shockwaves to everyone with Marvin Gaye being hit the hardest with the news. It is said this marked the start of drug abuse by Marvin Gaye. According to Terrell's fiancé, Dr. Ernie Garrett, who knew Gay, Tammy's mother, Jenny, angrily barred everyone at Motown from her funeral, except for Gay, who she felt was Terrell's closest friend. She blamed the label for failing to protect Terrell while she was undergoing abuse. Terrell's funeral service was held at the Jane's Methodist Church in Philadelphia. She was interred at Mount Lawn Cemetery in Sharon Hill, Pennsylvania. Despite her untimely death and short career, it is wild to imagine the indelible mark she left in the music industry. She overcame bigger barriers and everything that was thrown at her to ensure we experience her special gift. With all this beauty in the brains, we can only phantom what she would have turned out to be had she stayed much longer. Lastly, we should not feel sad of what she went through. Let's celebrate that she's in a happy place. She would never want us to empathize with her. She may have gone through all that abuse for us to learn that we can still turn out to be the best versions of ourselves regardless of the situation. No excuses. And as the great Martin Luther King Jr. would put it, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. 
Only love can do that. Let's try and forgive all those who did her wrong for it. It is through that that we prevent history from repeating itself.